really good morning from the kitchen folks. It's about 25 past four in the morning. I couldn't sleep. So I thought, why not get up and make myself an all grain stout? Like you do. So here are my key ingredients for today's brew. So I've got just over two kilos of malt. So I've got some Ballyhoo crushed roasted barley. I've got Simpsons Crystal Dark, a kilo of this, and I've got some crisp chocolate malt. There's less than a kilo here because I've already used some. So altogether between the three grains there, I've got about two and a half kilos. I'm going to be using some extra dark spray malt. My yeast of choice today is Craft Ale Yeast Number no. 3 from Bigger Junks which can tolerate higher strengths. And I am going for a slightly higher strength. I'm probably looking for between six and 7% today. Um, I'm using yeast nutrient from Young's. About 10 litres of water, possibly a little bit of dextrose monohydrate, brewing sugar. And I've got these hops, these are uh, Cascade hops from my own garden. They were picked last summer. They've been in the freezer since. I haven't weighed how many's there, but that's what I'm using. As ever, it's all a big experiment. Let's see what happens. And just to mention my fermentation vessel of choice today is the 11 litre Muntins wine fermenter. Right, I'm gonna begin by putting eight litres of water into my big pan. So I'm using spring water because the tap water in Leeds is a bit cloudy. Right, that's two litres in. I've got to add some more. You don't need to wash that. Right, that's eight litres of water in the pan. Lid on, and then it's gas on and heat on. And I want this to start to warm through. So at this point, my water temperature is currently 11 degrees or thereabouts. That's Celsius. I need this up into the 60s. Okay, so it's a good while later and the water is over temperature. So I've taken the heat off. I'm actually on 80 at the minute, but that's fine. I'm gonna to start to dump my grains into there. I've turned the heat off, and then I'm gonna put the heat back on when the temperature's dropped into the 60s. What I need to try and do is keep it in the mid 60s, because that's when all the fermentable sugars will be released from the grains. I'm gonna begin by adding my crushed roasted barley. And adding the grains itself will bring the temperature down. So that's those in. I'll give them a stir so they mix. I don't want them to stick to the bottom of the pan, which is why I didn't put the grains in first. And I've put the water in first. I've got a real hit of, uh, it smells like roasting coffee, roasting Horlicks, a bit of chocolatey. Really good smell. Now I'm gonna add my crisp chocolate malt on top. And again, I wanna give that a stir so it mixes in. Oh, smells brilliant. I absolutely love the smell when the malts hit the hot water. And the whole house will smell like a brewery. My wife will be waking up saying, he's making a beer. And finally, I'm adding the Simpsons Crystal Dark. This is a lighter malt than the other two, despite its name. So again, I'll give that a stir. And you can see that the physical volume of what's in the pan has increased with the addition of that malt. Yeah, it's really smelling like Ovaltine or Horlicks now. So I'll take another temperature test. The ambient temperature in the room is currently 17.9. So let's see what this is now. So this is 79 degrees. So I'm not putting any heat on this at the minute. I'm gonna leave it to cool until it's into the 60s and then I'll play with the gas burner to keep it at that temperature. So I'm just gonna put this on so that the steam can escape and the smells can escape. I could put the lid on, but you can sometimes get sort of a cabbagey smell and quality to it if you do that and I don't want to do that. So this just allows it to breathe a little bit. So I'll come back to you when this is down to the 60s in its temperature. Okay, it's a good 90 minutes later. Let's have a look at the temperature now. 61, 62, 
So I want to try and keep this around the 65 mark for the next hour. So I'm going to put some heat onto it, just very gently. I'll put this back on and I'll just keep an eye on it. So at this stage it's pretty straightforward. I'm just trying to keep this now around about 65 for an hour. I've not got much else to do other than monitor it with the thermometer and keep coming back and giving it a stir. So I'll come back to you in about an hour's time. All right, this has been a good while now. It's been well over an hour, probably nearer to two hours in all honesty. But I seem to have kept the temperature reasonably towards the mid 60s. Right, it's just at the upper end now, it's on 68. So I'm gonna turn this off and all I'm gonna do now is leave it to cool. Nice and straightforward, nothing else to do. So that goes back on there. I'll come back to you in a bit, a couple of hours, whenever. Right, it's a good three hours later. This has cooled down to a reasonable temperature. I can put my hand on the pan so I wouldn't call it hot, it's just warm. I now need to transfer from here into this pan in the sink using this jug and I'm gonna be filtering out the grain as I do it. So this is a bit of a mucky job, but it's got to be done. And that, look at the color of that. Right, in we go. It's like black porridge. And yeah, this makes a right mess of the kitchen. I shall be going around doing lots of wiping afterwards. Or oh, my wife will kill me. So the sieve's full and we're just going to let that drain for a little bit and then I'll come back to it. Right, I've let this drain for 15 minutes. There's still lots of water in there, but I'm not too bothered at this point. So I'm going to keep that as it is. And I'm going to empty that grain into this wok because I haven't finished with this grain yet. So that goes to one side for a minute and I can get back on with doing this into there. So rather than use the jug, I think I'm going to brave a pour this time. So that's what's in there. And that's what's in there. Right, I'm going to have to do some shutting about now. So what I want to do is just lift this into here because this is now full and I need to tip that back into the big pot. So a bit of messing around altogether. So there's plenty dripping off this. So very quickly into the wok. And now what I want to do is pour this into the big pan. And this goes back on here. I want to press this and get as much liquid out as I can do before carrying on. So while that's draining, I'm just going to cover this one over. So there's still lots of water in this, but that's fine. I'm going to now put this into the other wok. And there's barely anything come out of it, actually. Literally a tiny bit. You can see there, I'm going to tip that into the other pan. So this pan here, I'm done with for the time being. I'm simply going to put a lid on it. But I'm going to put all this now back into the smaller of the two pans. That's possibly going to be quite messy, let's see. Oh, that wasn't too bad actually. The thing about using grain is the mess it makes of your kitchen. It really does. Especially when you're using really dark grains like these. Now I can't really sparge with the setup that I've got, but in homage to the sparge, I want to add some water onto those grains now. I've got two litres of spring water here, which I'm just pouring on. And I'm just going to lift and mix those grains because there will be plenty of fermentable sugars amongst that lot. So my pan with the grain and the water in is now back on the ring. I'm putting some gas on and some heat on and I'm going to bring this up to the 60s like I did last time and I'm going to let that sit at 65-ish for another half an hour. Now you don't need to watch me adjust the cooker again and do all that. You saw me do it the first time. It's pretty much the same process. Once it gets to the mid 60s, I'm leaving it at that for about half an hour. Then I'm turning it right off and I'm leaving it to go reasonably cool. So once that's happened and it's gone reasonably cool, I'll come back to you. It's gonna be a few hours, so I'll see you then. And just out in the garden, there's Mr. Gray on the shed. 
getting teased by a couple of magpies. You're not fast enough, Mr. Grey. Right, it's time to restrain. So I'm going to just go for a pour this time. Oh, lovely and messy. All over the place. So I should be doing plenty of wiping. But that's what I've got in there. I need to let that just work its way through. So for now, that goes on. And I'll be back in a bit. Okay, these have had a good hour. Let's have a look. And that is what you call some kind of barley cake. So a lot of the liquid has come out of these, but it still does retain some moisture. But for now, I'm just going to lift this off there and pop it into the wok like I did the first time around. So I'm just going to put the lid on that and put this out of the way for now. And then I'm going to take the rest of the black tar and I'm going to pour that into the sieve just like last time. Okay, I'm covering that over just like before leaving it for three quarters of an hour, then I'll come back to it. In fact, I've actually run out of time now, so I'm going to have to leave this drain in just there, and I've got, obviously, my grains in the wok just there. I'll have to pick this up in the morning. I need to get ready, because I'm actually off to the theatre tonight. So I'll pick this up in the morning. Catch you then. Hey, folks, it's the next morning. Let's have a look at those grains. Now, when I got back last night, I did actually top this up because it had sank where the water had come out of it and I topped it up from what was in the wok just there. And it's a real solid cake now. So I'm quite tempted actually to just dump this now as it is and not use this. This will actually become garden fertiliser. But I'm seriously considering not squeezing this. I was going to put this into cloth bags and give it a squeeze. But for the mess it's going to make, and for the little I'll get out of it, I don't really think it's worth it. I think I'm happy enough with what I've got. So I've disposed of my grains, and this is what I've got in the pan. I would estimate there's probably about six litres of extracted grain water just here. I've just taken my hops out of the freezer, and I'm now going to add these into here. And finally, box number three. Freezing cold, as it happens. Right, that's all my hops in. So I'm going to put the heat on. Lid on. And now I want this to come to a boil. So this is going to take a while. I'll come back to you when it's simmering. Quick update and lesson learned. Don't leave the pot unattended. Okay, this is too dangerously hot for me to do anything with it at the minute. I'm just going to leave it to cool a bit and then I want to transfer it into a cleaner pan and then restart it. Well, folks, you know, brewing is a journey. You sometimes set off thinking you know what you're going to make and then things happen along the way that change your mind. Today is one of those days. Now, you've seen the title of the film, so you know what I'm now going to aim to make, but I hadn't set off to make this. I'd started it in mind with making a stout, a moderate strength stout, and now I'm going for a silly strength Baltic porter. Yeah, but not just any Baltic porter, raspberry ripple flavour. So raspberry ripple is an ice cream flavour, so the predominant flavours in raspberry ripple are raspberry and vanilla. So do you want to see my raspberry and vanilla? Well for my raspberry, I'm using this from Home Bargains. This was a pound and if you're British and of a certain age, then you will recognise this symbol straight away. Swizzles, raspberry lollipops. And uh, yeah, I'm going to be using a cordial which is based upon that flavour. So raspberry ripple is raspberry and vanilla. So there's my raspberry. So no real raspberries. They will make it bitter anyway. And it's winter in the UK right now. Where am I going to get raspberries from that taste like anything decent? Impossible. Can't ever buy tomatoes at the minute. So my vanilla is going to come from my protein flav drops vanilla flavoring and I shall just put a little bit of this in so this is going to go into the brew at ferment stage so these are two additional ingredients the other environmental factor which has had an impact upon my decision to make this beer is the fact that we are now about to enter a cold snap it's going to go to minus two degrees celsius tonight and it's going to be minus six degrees celsius 
by Thursday night. I have no chance of fermenting an ale yeast at that. My heat mat is currently occupied by a very large batch of tomato paste wash. So the ale yeast isn't going to do any good at all. So I'm changing it instead for this. So this is Mangrove Jack's Bohemian Lager Yeast M84, suitable for German Bohemian Pilsners, Baltic Porter and American style lagers. So yeah, folks, Raspberry Ripple, Baltic Porter. Let's do it. So the first thing I need to do is empty this disgusting pan of murk. Okay, all the hops are in there somewhere. This has been sitting for eight hours now. It's gone down to room temperature. So I'm, I'm fine with the hoppiness of this now. So I'm gonna pour that through a strainer into a fresh pan. I remember now why I stopped doing all grain and it was because of the mess. I just got fed up with it. Yeah, so just pouring that has made a mess which I'm having to clean up. All grain, when you make it this way in the kitchen, it's not the tidiest of brews, I have to say. Right, I need to lift this out of there. And this has got to drain. So I'm gonna have to probably use the old pan again, I think, because uh, this is actually in the liquid as it currently is. Easier said than done. Right, it's gonna have to go back in. Right, this is gonna have to go back over the old pan because I'm in the level of the liquid. I need to let these hops drain for a little while. I'll come back to you. So I'm gonna give them a gentle bit of encouragement. I'm just trying to avoid the sieve falling into the pan. You can tell that the hot flowers hold a lot of liquid. And this is where the flavor is. Right, I'm satisfied. I've squeezed everything out of those that I'm going to, so they will be going on the garden as compost. So there's the extra inky blackness that's come out of the hops. And I'm just gonna pour that into my other pan. Ooh, gloopy. What a mess. I want to bring this to the boil now, but I also want to add spray malt and brewing sugar, and that is gonna up the physical volume of this. So I've had to scrub the big old pan that was on the hob, and now I'm gonna go back into there. I just seem to be going from one pan to another to other. Yuck. Right, I've got the big pan on. I've got some heat underneath it. I've got my extra dark spray malt, and I'm going to stir that in, pour and stir. Okay, so that's all lumpy and clumpy and that's gonna take a bit of heat before that starts to dissolve and disperse within there. Well, that's coming up to temperature. I'm now gonna weigh out a kilogram of dextrose monohydrate brewing sugar. And yeah, that is quite a lot, but I am going for Baltic Porter. So slightly over a kilo, but that's absolutely fine. And I'm gonna add that into the mix also. Now this is gonna be diluted with more spring water. So this isn't the final liquid content. But I'm not anticipating adding any more sugars of any kind or any fermentable material in there now. So I'm going to give this a good stir. The brewing sugar dissolves really easily. Okay, I'm waiting for this to come to a simmer now. Note, I'm not putting a lid on. There won't be a boil over this time. Um, I think I need to do some cleaning. So just a little update, it's hotted up in the kitchen, I've had to take the jacket off. But look, nice and sparkling and clean, I've even put the tops in the dishwasher. And this is looking pretty good. Now it hasn't come to a simmer yet, but all of the spray malt and all of the brew sugars have now dissolved. And obviously with the amount of steam being produced, this isn't far off coming to a simmer. I'll be back. Okay, we're a good 40 minutes later and this is happening. This is the boil stage. That's good. I'm going to leave this for 30 minutes and then it's going off. So I'm tempting fate. I've got the lid perched on there, but at least it's on top of the grill. I'm just not wanting too much of a liquid to evaporate, that's all. 
fingers crossed I don't get another eruption. Okay, time's up, I'm done. Heat's going off. And as far as this goes, that's going on. So this is going to be a three day preparation. Final day preparation and brew day one will be tomorrow. See you then. Hey folks, it's preparation day three, which will be brew day one. And I'm now beginning by putting some water into this saucepan. Hmm. So there's just under a litre gone in there and I'm adding to it half of this bottle of raspberry cordial, not the full bottle, that will be too raspberry. A little bit more. That'll do, it does say it contains real fruit. But what this also contains is preservative, sodium metabisulfate, right there. That's the bad stuff. So I've got the gas on and the heat on and I want to bring this up to a boil. Now, why am I doing this? Well, sodium metabisulfate is a preservative and there is a school of thought that says that that will impede the brew. In reality, it will probably just slow down fermentation beginning. But that same school of thought also says if you boil the sodium metabisulfate, it can nullify it. Now, in all honesty, I don't believe it that much, but I go through the motions anyway. Um, I don't think it makes much difference at all, if I'm qu quite honest. What usually happens is it takes a couple of days longer for fermentation to establish, but it will still ferment. So while I'm waiting for this to start simmering, this is yesterday's beer wort so far, and that now needs transferring into my fermentation vessel of choice, my Munton's wine fermenter. So I'm just going to drain out the water that I've currently got in there. This has been sanitised and rinsed. And there's Poppy the cat, who's also interested in the brew process. I'm sure. Oh, Poppy seems to have uh, taken a move. Right, I'm going to begin by putting the rest of this two litre bottle of spring water into the fermenter. Right, now it's time for that big dramatic beer wart pour. Ooh, the drama. That is some thick stuff at the bottom. Whoa. So I'm going to get a lot of sediment in this beer, which is why I'm using a two gallon rather than a one gallon fermenter for this brew. So that's the story so far. Right, I'll get my vanilla flavour in. So I'm going to put two full pipettes of the My Protein Flav Drops Vanilla Essence in there. And I've experimented this and a full pipette is the equivalent to about 14 drops or thereabouts. I don't want to put any more in because it's very strong. The raspberry cordial is boiling away. Let's get that down to a simmer. I'm going to give it five minutes like that and then I'm knocking it off. So while I'm waiting for that to finish simmering, I'm going to add some of my dry ingredients. So I'm going to put some pectolase in and I didn't mention this in the initial ingredients list because I wasn't going to bother. But because I've put the hops in there, they might give it sort of a, a sludgy brownie quality and I want this to be a good strong black because it is a Baltic porter. Um, so this might help to reduce some of the haze caused by uh, basically boiling the hop flowers. So I'm just going to sprinkle this into the funnel and I might put a bit more in as well. This will get washed through in a minute. I'm also going to add two nice rounded dessert spoonfuls of yeast nutrient. Give that yeast plenty to feed on. Okay, five minutes are up. I'm turning that off. Let's get the lid off. Steamy. And I'm just going to cool this down slightly with some cold spring water. And I'm doing that because I want to pour it into the fermenter, which is made of plastic. Right, in goes the raspberry, nice and pink. And the physical volume has now come right up. I'm going to add some more spring water into here. Okay, I'll leave it at that for a second, because what I want to do now is to take the gravity reading as it currently is to see if I'm going to be at a Baltic porter strength. So I'm just going to give this a stir around to ensure that everything is mixed together so that my gravity reading is accurate. Right, let's see where we're going to get. Buoyant. Oh yes, this is definitely Baltic porter strength. 
Now I'm still on 26 degrees Celsius so it's not an accurate temperature to take a gravity reading but it's very much indicative and it's on 1.090. That's massive. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to water it down a little bit with some more spring water. I was wondering whether I needed to add any more sugar but I don't. 1.080 at the minute and I've got enough liquid in here now so this is possibly going to come and make a mess out through the airlock. If it does, it does. I'll just wash it all out. It's not really a problem. I've taken out 100ml and I'm going to put this in the fridge until it gets down to 20 degrees Celsius. Then I'll take another gravity reading and that will be my original gravity. So I'm now going to add my Mangrove Jacks M84 yeast and I'm going to use half of this packet. This packet does up to 23 litres, there's no point in me putting it all in. The yeast multiplies anyway. So I'm just sprinkling that on top and I'll use the rest in another brew. Now just to explain to you, a Baltic porter is a strong porter but it's fermented at cold temperatures with lager yeast and then it's conditioned and then left to lager like you would a lager. It gives it a more lager-like quality, but a porter-like look. I'm going to put my Muntins wine fermenter together. So first of all, this goes in the top. This is kind of like to try and hopefully prevent the worst of any Kraus and overspill coming through the airlock. I mean, if it does happen, it does happen. I'm not going to cry about it. Then the nice integrated airlock simply screws into place and you've just got to make sure it's not cross-threaded, which that isn't. Then I add water into the airlock until it begins to dribble out and then I know it's full. And there we go, that's full. And I put the airlock cap on top, which snaps into place. So that's then held into place with the clamping screw. It's actually a really well designed and a very good piece of kit, this. I do like brewing with it. So just looking at this, I can see straight away that the yeast is doing something at the edges. It's, there's a little bit of froth, which is the early, early, early signs of a Krausen being thought about. This is quite a wide area, so I'm hopeful that the Krausen will spread, but there's a very good chance it will just spread and go nuclear and come out of the top. And if that happens, it happens, and it will all end up coming out through here and coming down the edge. But I'm going to leave this on the kitchen drainer to ferment for the next few days anyway. This is down to 20 degrees. Let's take that original gravity. Nice and buoyant. And I'm starting off on an original gravity of exactly 1.080. Okay, I'm happy enough with that. So the temperature differentiation doesn't seem to have made a massive amount of difference to the gravity reading. I'm just going with 1.080, 1080. Right, I've got my fermenter labelled up. Raspberry Ripple Baltic Porter, 6th of March 23, which is brew day one. Original gravity 1.080. So before I go, I'm just going to cover this over with a towel and that's because I'm in direct sunlight here on the kitchen sink and I don't want it to damage the beer, which it could do. So I'm just going to cover the fermenter with this and then in a couple of days time, I'm going to be moving this away from here anyway into my office, which is the coldest room in the house. Right, the next film that you see from me will be a fermentation uh, progress update, hopefully later today, and if not, in a couple of days' time. See you later. We have a brew day one fermentation update. Fermentation has begun on the first day. The Krausen is about half a centimetre thick. Uh, it's not a rapid fermentation, but I'm getting a bubble through about every 15 seconds or thereabouts. So we'll have another update in the morning and we'll see what's happening then. So it's a brew day two update. Now this is the thermometer which is on the Muntins wine fermenter. It doesn't come with it, I've stuck it on. It suggests that the temperature of this brew is between 18 and 20. However, I've got a thermometer on top which suggests that the temperature is nearer 11.8. So is fermentation causing a heat increase within this vessel. Is that science? I mean, that could be happening. I'm not quite sure. But there's quite a difference between 18 to 20 and 11.9, just getting up to 12. And the central heating's come on, so that suggests why that might have happened. And of course, I also have to face the possibility that the thermometer up here might not be accurate. 
Anyway, what I think I'm going to do is I'm going to move this into my office. I was going to leave it on here for a couple of days, but I did mention I'm going away. Um, I'm going to move it into my office and I'm just going to stand it on something. So if it does flood through the airlock, then it won't go onto the floor. But looking at how it's behaving currently, I don't think it is actually going to go flooding. So I've moved into my office where, oddly, the temperature has gone up, although to me it feels cooler in here. I'll give you an update in a couple of days' time when I'm back from Liverpool. Well, as promised, here's a brew day for update. And I've had to bring the beer back into the kitchen because it went down to 7.5 degrees Celsius in my office and it stopped fermenting. It's now on 13.3 here in the kitchen. It does say 16 or between 14 and 16 on there. So there's definitely an inaccuracy between that and this. But at least it started fermenting again. The Krausen's built back up. It had sort of gone a bit flat. I didn't film that because I was just a bit tired and I couldn't be bothered. So the project continues. I'll give you an update if anything dramatic happens. Otherwise it will be towards the end of fermentation. See you then. So a brew day five update. I wasn't going to do an update, but... The Krausen's gone flat again and nothing's happening in the bubbler. Now the temperature on here is reading between 14 and 16 like it was the other day. Down here it says 12.9 so it should be in the range of 10 to 14 for this yeast. So I really don't know what's happening. I can't imagine that fermentation is completed. The other thing to report on is that is the scene in the garden today. Yeah. Absolutely bonkers. I cannot believe that it's March and this is the snow that we've got, which is obviously affecting temperatures all around. But still, I'm surprised that this isn't fermenting at all. So I'm really not sure what to do at this point. I'm going to have to have a think about it. So I've had a think about it and I think I'm not going to do anything at all. I'm just going to leave it. I'll wait for the temperatures to come back up again and see if the fermentation kicks back in. I could try adding some more yeast, but I don't think it's going to make any difference. Or I could try adding a different yeast. That's another option I've got. And I have got some uh, Kvike Boss yeast, which I could try. Uh, everyone goes on about how amazing it is. I've never used it before. But I'll keep that on the back burner for now. So I'll come back to you in a few days' time, and then we'll see what's happening. It's a little bit of a brew evening in the kitchen tonight, as you can see. But in this film right now, I'm here to talk to you about the Raspberry Ripple Baltic Porter. And I'm going to level with you. I'm a little bit miffed with it. It's brew day 18. Yet it stopped doing anything fermentation wise after about four or five days. And I just don't believe that it's fermented out that quickly from 1.080 as the original gravity. So we did have some cold weather outside. I put it on a heat pad just to sort of keep the temperature uh, reasonable and it seemed to be doing okay. Um, but it just stopped and I don't really know what's going on. So I think I need to have a look inside it, have a little sniff and dip the hydrometer in. So lid police look away, but I haven't really got much of the choice. So let's do that. Okay, sniff, sniff. Well, it smells all right. It smells, yeah, it smells like a porter and it smells like raspberry. That's what it looks like. That's just froth on top. I don't want to keep the lid off for too long. I'm just going to see if I can take a hydrometer reading to see where we are currently. Hopefully it won't hit the bottom. Right, it's on 1.030. It's dropped 50. Hmm, I'm a bit miffed. Right, hydrometer out, in fact. Yeah, let's have a quick taste. Hmm. Burnt coffee with a slight raspberry edge. Hmm, nice. Over time, when that's matured, that'll be all right, though. But has it finished? It doesn't feel like it's done enough. Okay. It is currently 6.6%. Now, that is not the Baltic Porter strength that I wanted. 
and there's a ton of sugar in there. So I'm going to add a bit more yeast, but I'm not going to add the same yeast. I'm going to add a little bit of Kvaik Voss yeast. Now only a little bit, I don't want to put tons in, but I'm wondering if that might just give it a bit more of a boost. So I don't know if this is a good idea or not. I'm going to do it anyway. There are still sugars in there and I think this could go lower in terms of a final gravity. I'm just not satisfied with 1.030. I always want more. I'm just going to scatter a little bit on top. There's the equivalent of about a teaspoon gone in there. Very quickly I'm going to put this back together. I'm not going to agitate it. I'm leaving as is. The yeast can sink naturally. Let's see if the Kvaik Voss does something. I'll come back to you and let you know. Well, would you Adam and Eve it? The Kvaik Voss yeast has been in there for less than five minutes. This hasn't done that for 10 days. I can even see the beginnings of a Krausen starting again. It must be true what they say. It's a proper wonder yeast. Anyway, I'll come back to you with an update tomorrow. I think this might be quite interesting. Afternoon folks, it's the next day and fermentation has stopped. Again, I don't know what's going on with this. So I'm going to take the lid off again, sorry lid please, um, and I'm going to have another look at the gravity and then I might do some more yeast things. I think. So I'm probably going to do something today which is going to get me on the Facebook group Why Are Homebrewers Like That? Uh, again, I've probably already been on there, but you know what? I'm just going to go for it. So I'm taking the towel off, which is protecting it from the sunlight. It will be off for a very short amount of time, so there's no worry about skunking. And I'm taking the lid off again. And once again, let's have a hydrometer dip test. So it was 1.030 when I looked last night, and it is still 1.030. Zero. Okay, so I'm going to add a little bit more yeast again. However, before doing that, I'm going to stick my big spoon in it, which I've just washed, and I'm going to give it a stir upwards. I want to agitate it. I'm not bothered about the fact that there's sediment in the bottom and then I'm now messing it all up, because I'm just going to leave it for ages anyway before I bottle it, so it's fine. But I just want to try and do what I can to sort of reactivate and reinvigorate this because it just hasn't fermented out enough as far as I'm concerned. So that's now stirring nicely. So I'll take this out. Now I'm going to add a little bit more of the Kvike yeast, equivalent of a teaspoon, and not just the Kvike yeast, and this is where Frankenstein's monster comes into it. I'm also going to add a little bit, and I mean a sprinkle, of champagne yeast, which is quite high tolerance yeast. So it's not um, EC1118, but it's an equivalent, so a contemporary. So now this has had three different yeasts in it. E, it's right yeasty. So I've washed my spoon again, and I'm just going to give that a little mix around, because I want everything to mix in properly this time. And this is either going to work, or it's not going to work. It's a 50-50 thing. I'm making it up as I go along. I have no idea. Right, I'm going to put this back in the top. I'm going to screw this back on. And I'm going to put this back around it to keep the sun off. But me doing that has immediately had the same effect as what it did yesterday. I can already see a bit of a Krausen forming again around the edge. And bubbles have started again. I'll give you an update later on. So just a further update. I've moved this into the living room now. It's next to a couple of uh, carrot paste washers and the bubbling seems to have stopped but I'm just going to leave it in here and then I'll have another look in a week's time. I'll see you then. Evening from the kitchen folks. I've lost track of time a bit but I think this is brew day 29 and this is my raspberry ripple baltic porter and what I'm just going to do in this short segment of film is rack it from there into two demijohns because I'm hoping to bottle it in the next day or two but I'd just like to have a look at it in a demijohn so I can inspect it a bit closer before I actually bottle it. So this is just a short segment of film just showing you the process that I go through.
So first things first, with the Munton's wine fermenter, I'm going to completely remove the airlock from the top of it. Otherwise I'll get a vacuum inside it. And then using a funnel into my demijohn, I'm hoping to be able to just press the tap up and get this out and into there. And that's coming out nicely. Actually, I'm going to have a change of funnel because I'm not right happy with this one. Apologies, that funnel was a bit too small. It's trial and error. I'm going to stick with this one that I normally use. I don't know why I didn't just use this one, to be quite honest. I think I just thought I'd try something different. So you can see that coming through. There is some sediment that's come through with it, but there isn't tons. And the majority of the sediment line is actually below where the uh, tap uh, takes in the liquid. Anyway, this isn't the most exciting thing in the world to watch. I'm just letting you know what I'm doing. I'll come back to you when it's done. I've got two demijohns to fill. Right, I've got two nicely filled demijohns. They're filled and cleaned and I've got myself a sampler. I'm going to show you what you can do with this. And obviously, I'm going to drink it, it's a sampler, but I'd like to replicate what it might be like if it had been pulled through a beer engine. Say hello. So just take it steady. Oh. Right. I'm just getting a bit of air into it. It's that. Now, let's have a look at this. Now look at the layers in that now, it's like a pint of Guinness. So I just put the camera on it so you can see for yourself how it settles and changes and I'll get a really nice creamy head on it. Probably a bit too much, but you get the picture. So there it is, and the noise you can hear is me just draining the Muntons wine fermenter. It's going to take a bit of cleaning, but let's have a sample and see what it tastes like. That is absolutely fantastic. That flavour has really developed actually over the last week or so. This is going to be great after maybe three, four months in the bottle, even longer. It's sweet and it's bitter. So you've got the bitter burnt coffiness from those grains and then you've got the sweetness from the raspberry and the vanilla. Complements each other nicely. Given time, I think this is going to be a cracker. So I would say experiment successful at this point. Let's see what it's like when I open the bottles in a couple of months time. Anyway, cheers folks. I'm going to enjoy this one. Anyway, the next film that you see from me is going to be bottling. It's either going to be tomorrow or the day after. I'm hoping it shouldn't be any later than that. So I'll catch you then. Morning from the kitchen folks. It's the next day. Whatever brew day that is, I've lost track. It'll be on the subtitle. Anyway, it was zero degrees outside overnight. This was in my porch and the Raspberry Ripple Baltic Porter is now ready for bottling. Any bits and pieces that were in suspension have fallen to the bottom. There's virtually no sediment line on this one. On that one, this must have been the first one out. There's a tiny, tiny amount. But yeah, this is good to go. So today it's going out of there and into these. I want my porter to have a sparkle, a bit of fizz. So I'm going to put some sugar into each of these bottles, just half a teaspoonful. They're 500 ml bottles. And this is just standard household granular sugar. When the yeast which is left in suspension in there finds this sugar, It'll smash it apart, there'll be a fractional fermentation which will increase the ABV by a minute amount but a byproduct of that will be carbon dioxide, CO2 which will build up in the bottle, it will create pressure and that will give it a sparkle. That's the plan anyway, let's hope it works out. Then it's bung out, sometimes easier said than done, here we go. Yep. I'm going to put the siphoning tube in. Now I'm not going to be able to see where it is because it's so dark in there. I'm just sort of guesstimating where the bottom is. I don't mind this going right to the bottom in all honesty because I can't really see much in the way of sediment in there. So that feels like it's a couple of mil off the bottom. So hopefully that'll be about right. 
Apologies for any background noise that you might be able to hear. I live next to an airport, so it does get a little bit noisy at times, especially when they're all taking off in the morning. Right, first bit that comes out is going into the hydrometer tube, then we're into the bottles. Let's rock and flipping roll. And it's like licorice and tar and everything else, which is very, very, very dark. Right, into the bottles I go. I'll take out the hydrometer, pop that there. This is going to be a bit of a job seeing where it is because it's so dark and the bottles are dark. I mean, just look at the colour of that. That says Porter all day long. Okay, I've got to fill all these bottles up. I'll come back to you when they're done. A couple of minutes. Okay, I've just reached the end of the first damage on. Okay, time is of the essence now because I don't want any oxidisation to take place. But I'll show you what I've got and then we'll go to capping. So the first image on has given me eight full bottles and then almost a full bottle, which I'll continue this one from what's in there. And I'll need to get these capped. Okay, so firstly, I'm going to explain to you that this is poor practice that I'm going to do now because I'm going to bottle at counter level just so you can see it properly on the film. You should really bottle downwards into a sink and then you've got better leverage and your bottle is less chance of slipping. So the higher you bottle up, the more chance you have of uh, knocking it around. So downwards into the sink is always better, but it's just easier for me to film it at this level. So I've got a standard crown capper. Pac-Man, whatever you want to call it, Space Invaders. Uh, not my favourite device, but it's cheap and cheerful. Uh, I put the cap, which has been in boiling water, just there. Holds magnetically, put it over the bottle, and then gently and evenly lower the arms, like so. That's good, that's fine, and there you go. So that is one capped. I've got some more to do. You don't need to watch me do that over and over again. I'll come back to you when they're done. Okay, I'm just gonna give these a shower to get all the sticky residue off. Capping was pretty straightforward. I did the rest of them downwards into the sink where the bottles are now, made it a lot easier. Okay, that's them lot now draining and waiting to be labeled. I've got the other damage on to do now in exactly the same way. You don't need to watch me do that. It's a repeat process. So I'll come back to you when I've got all those bottled and then we'll start to look at the final gravity and alcohol by volume. <sighs> that was a bit of a mission, but here's the net result. 18 full bottles of Raspberry Ripple Baltic Porter ready to be labelled in my Dresdener Feldschlossen crate all the way from the Feldschlossen Brewery in Dresden, Saxony, Germany, which as a piece of trivia for you, is my favorite city in the entire world. What a cracking place to visit and what cracking beer. Well, it's been a bit of a mission, but the cleanup process is just about done. So let's have a look at that final gravity. In goes the hydrometer. A little bit of buoyancy and it is still quite a bit higher than I would like a final gravity to be but when you're doing all grain I think you get that sort of gloopiness to your liquid which is going to affect the gravity it's not necessarily all sugar and it's finished on 1.028 1028 so let's work out the final alcohol by volume for this brew so it started off with an original gravity of 1.080 I deduct from that the final gravity of 1.028, which equals 0.052. And then I multiply this by 131.25, which gives me a final alcohol by volume of 6.8%, which is not in the Baltic Porter category, but it's certainly a decent Porter. And for a Porter, I'm happy enough with that. So we'll just call this Raspberry Ripple Porter. So now I know that ABV it's time to make those labels. Okay, I've made some labels up using a very simple template and this is for a Bluetooth Fomimo 
printer. You can probably see the model there if you're interested in what it is. Um, it's just a nice little gadget, but it does the trick. It's proper fancy, isn't it? So then it's just a case of putting the labels on the bottles. It's nice to make a good job of it so you know what you're drinking. Just take a little bit of pride because I do take pride on what's on the inside of the bottle. So I like to take pride on what's on the outside. Two done. I've got another 16 to go. I'll come back to you when they're done. There they all are. A proper ragtag bunch. Welcome to the conservatory folks. This is where my Raspberry Ripple Baltic Porter is going to condition for the next six weeks or so. So here we are, this is a south facing conservatory. It's only April and it's already a very good temperature in here. In fact, it's 20 degrees at 10 to 11 in the morning, 10.50 in the morning. So you can imagine how warm it does get. In fact, it gets up into the high 20s and into the 30s sometimes. So this is going under there. So there's a little bit of shade and shelter for it and it's going to stay under there for six weeks. So like any conservatory the temperature fluctuates very warm in the daytime very cool at night but that nice average in between is going to be enough for this to condition. The conditioning process is what will help to give it a sparkle when the yeast which is in suspension in the beer meets that bit of sugar which I put in each bottle and it will also allow the flavour to develop so the raspberry might become more prominent the vanilla might become more prominent and the harshness of the actual coffee dark burnt coffee flavours from the grains might reduce a little bit. I'm hoping it's all going to work out and mix nicely. So far it seems good. Anyway, I'll catch you in about six weeks time when it comes to opening and tasting. See you then. Afternoon from the kitchen folks. It's my Raspberry Ripple Porter grand opening day. It's been in the bottle conditioning for 51 days. I've had it in the fridge for a couple of hours. It's nice and cool, it's a hot day outside. I must admit, hot days aren't meant for porters, but I've not got a lot else to drink, so I'm going for it. So, and what I want is a sparkle. I want it to taste nice, I want it to smell nice. I obviously want it to have the qualities of a porter. I want it to smell like I can smell a bit of like raspberry and vanilla-ness in there. But above all, I want it to taste like an absolute corker. Now, I don't know if it will or not. I don't even know if I've got a sparkle. It's all a big experiment as ever. Right, am I going to get a... Oh, I got a little one. Now, it weren't massive, but it were there. You heard it, I heard it. What does it look like when I pour it? Okay, so head retention, not happening. That's a real shame. Let me give it a bit of gravity. See what happens. Okay. Now, that's starting to come together a little bit. And that's more what you'd expect something like a porter or a stout to look like. Okay, now from here, I can tell you now that I can already smell the raspberry. And then when you get closer in, you get the burnt qualities that you get with a porter, you know, or with a stout, that kind of thing. You can tell that toasted grain smell is there. And actually that doesn't look too bad, does it? In fact, let's get the picture done for the video. Ready? One, two, three. Right, now, now it smells pretty decent and it's kept the head now I've poured it, so it was obviously me pouring it like a bit of a wally, but uh, now I've got it right, that's not looking too bad, is it? Okay, let's give it a little whirl. Lovely sparkle, not too much. It's just right, that because you don't want a fizzy porter, but you want a little bit of something to know that there's some life in it. And I've got it. The dark toasted malt barley, whatever it was that went in there. Yeah, that is definitely coming through that really dark flavor. But like pudding, the raspberry comes through. Now the vanilla, it's, it's a little bit lost in the other flavors and particularly in the sweetness of the raspberry. But do you know what? I could justify this saying it's raspberry ripple flavour. I, I, honestly, 
There's no reason why you couldn't sell this and say this was Raspberry Ripple Baltic Porter. Well, not Baltic because it's not strong enough, but Porter. Actually tastes quite nice. Now in the last couple of dark beers that I've done that are flavoured with cordials, they've been a little bit too sweet. This is just a nice balance, so less is more. It balances really well the sweetness of the cordial with the really harsh darkness of the grain and the spray malt. So I'm quite happy with this. It's got a decent flavour and I think over time it's only going to get better. So, you know, let's give this six months and see what happens. Anyway, what I will do is save a couple of bottles for maybe one or two years and then we'll see how it pans out in the long run. Eh? Anyway, it's been a pleasure as always, folks. I'm looking forward to drinking this. It's a gorgeous day outside. So yeah, this is going to go down very well in the garden. Catch you next time. I don't finish like that, do I? No, this is how we finish. Catch you next time. <sighs> the film that you've just watched is a Moss Home and Garden production. You can find more by going to www dot mosshomeandgarden.co.uk I'd just like to say thank you very much for supporting my YouTube channel and for watching my films it really is very much appreciated if you haven't already done so please subscribe to my YouTube channel in order to receive future updates about the home and garden films which I upload you can find my YouTube channel by going to www.mosshomeandgarden.co.uk please click on the red subscribe button when you've done that a little bell will appear if you press that also then you'll get future updates about the films which I upload. If you like my films, if you like my style of filming then you might also like my travel channel which you will find by going to youtube.com forward slash Stuart Moss or typing www.mosstravel.tv Again if you could subscribe to that channel it would be hugely appreciated. If you'd like to get Moss Home and Garden updates on Facebook then please open Facebook and do a search for Moss Home and Garden and you will find the page. If you like the page, then you will get future updates on there. And if you'd like to connect on Instagram for home, garden and travel photography, as well as some stories, then my username is Stu Moss, S-T-U-M-O-S-S. -S. If you'd like to connect on Twitter, then my username is at Stuart Moss. And if you'd like to contact me about film usage or any other issue, please just email me on stewmosshomegarden at gmail.com. Once again, thank you very much for supporting my channel, for watching my films. I do appreciate it. I'd just like you all to have a great day.